Okay, so Frank O'Connor's Guest of the Nation is, I think, a good story to read after um, A Good Man is Hard to Find for a couple of reasons, particularly because so much of the story is so similar to the kind of last half of A Good Man is Hard to Find in the sense that what we have is an impending execution and all of these questions about whether or not it should happen, what the reasons are for it, whether or not it's justified, and all of these things. It's a good story as well because it helps us continue our conversation about mood and tone, okay? And so I want to talk a little bit about that today. But what I want to talk about first is what I'm going to assume is a reality that many of us will have when we start Guests of the Nation. This is a story published in the 1930 uh, about a conflict um, between uh, the, the British and the Irish about 10 years before that. And so it's very likely that when we start this story, we're coming to it without much cultural context for it. What I mean by that is we're not sure what's going on or why it's going on. There's also a number of characters introduced in a very short period of time. And it's not clear what their allegiances are. It's not clear what their personalities are like because they all have very distinctive personalities. Um, and so we're not sure why these people have come together. It's very different. Now, we've read a lot of stories in this class that have taken place at earlier historical points. Um, even, you know, Bartleby um, and the Yellow Wallpaper, even, you know, Young Goodman Brown. These are stories, most of those take place uh, not just a while ago, but in the first half of the 19th century. And even though those stories have had strange vocabularies, perhaps it hasn't been as difficult to kind of figure out, hey, what's, what's going on here? Who is who and why are these things happening? And, that, and there's some reasons for that that relate to cultural context and background and all of that. But here's the thing. If you keep reading, right, if you push into the story, what you find is that even though you're dealing with people, places, and things that are quite literally foreign to you and probably quite literally beyond your, your understanding, at the moment, what you will find is a very human scenario, by which I mean a scenario that you can empathize with, okay? Um, because it is not necessarily a foreign situation, by which I mean we have a character who's presented with the responsibility of having to execute captives. How is it that he will deal with that? How is it that the captains, uh, sorry, the captives, excuse me, the captives will deal with that and what is the likely outcome of this? So it's very dramatic. So one of the key things to... Uh, tune into in Guests of the Nation is that you can have a story that involves people, places, and things that you're not familiar with, but in a good story you're going to find that fundamental human connection, and we get it in the story in this question of life and death, and who has the right to decide who lives and who dies, and how is it that we treat people that we choose to execute, which is what we get in this story, and why the second half of it is so, uh, is so upsetting because of how things are carried out and how the end arrives. So let's keep that in mind as we move through the story. Let's also understand it's very important that this story is told in the first person. Right? We have a limited perspective of Bonaparte, right? uh, who is going along on this journey with the other people who are involved, Jeremiah Donovan and the others. Um, so we get his particular point of view, and that is so crucial because when we get to the end of the story, we're left with a very specific tone. Now, remember, a tone from yesterday has to do with the narrator's relationship with a subject or the subjects that he or she is talking about. And if we get to the last paragraph here, where the execution has happened and Bonaparte is reflecting on kind of the aftermath of the execution, we get a real specific statement about how he feels, how this event has made him feel, right? So if we go on to 380, and we're looking at this last paragraph going on to 381, it's a little long, but it bears reading, okay? Um, then by God, in the very doorway, she fell on her knees and began praying. And after looking at her for a minute or two, Noble did the same by the fireplace. I pushed my way out past her and left them at it. I stood at the door, 
watching the stars and listening to the shrieking of the birds dying out over the bogs. It is so strange what you feel at times like that that you can't describe it. Noble says he saw everything ten times the size, as though there were nothing in the whole world but that little patch of bog with the two Englishmen stiffening into it. But with me, so we're thinking about Tone, he's thinking about himself, he's talking about himself, but with me, it was as if the patch of bog where the Englishmen were was a million miles away. And even Noble and the old woman mumbling behind me and the birds and the bloody stars were all far away. So I'm going to read the rest in a second, but notice this intense feeling of isolation, right? He's literally feeling as if everything that he's just described, which we know physically is very near him, he's, he's feeling as if everything is far away and that he's very much isolated from everything. And I was somehow very small and very lost and lonely, like a child astray in the snow, which, which is a very desperate image, right? A child lost in the snow doesn't have good prospects, as we know from I'm a Mad Dog Biting Myself uh, for Sympathy, although I guess that child uh, was in the car and was rescued. But the narrator here is feeling very much removed from everything, very much isolated from everything. And, and before we kind of finish this description, we might ask ourselves, you know, is this a reaction that we could expect from people? It doesn't matter if they're Irish or English or Portuguese or Spanish or French or German or Korean or, you know, Chinese or Russian, or isn't this just a basic, is this a plausible basic human reaction, kind of the shock of being party to the brutal execution. And as you read the execution scene, you realize just how brutal it is. One guy has to be shot twice, and the other guy is shot in such a definitive way that he doesn't need to be shot again, probably suggesting, you know, the head is dramatically destroyed by the firing or something like that. But he's, he's reacting to being part, part of this. And anything that happened to me afterwards... I never felt the same about again. Well, that last line is really interesting. It's very sad, right? But being party to the execution, he's aware that it not just it's not just in the moments afterwards that he feels isolated. He's aware that this event has had significance to the rest of his life. He doesn't go into a lot of detail about that, but the the, the tone that emerges um, at the end of this piece is one of kind of profound isolation from the rest of the world and a sense of being essentially out of step with who he was before. So the event itself is enormously significant to the individual. So that's a consideration of this passage and just thinking about tone in terms of the narrator reflecting on himself. If we were to think about mood, right, that then connects with you. And the question is, you know, what is the kind of emotional experience that the story brings up in you? And I think, and you may disagree, which is, which is fine, but, you know, one of the things I would point out is I think one of the realities of the story for modern readers is that probably the mood shifts from confusion and frustration as you're trying to figure out what's going on in the story to probably something like a sense of sadness, perhaps a sense of pity, or perhaps you think, hey, you participated in the murder of those two guys. Uh, you, you are feeling how you should. You know, if you feel bad, you feel isolated, you feel removed. That's, that's what you get. So you may or may not have sympathy for the narrator is what I'm trying to get at. What's really important to distinguish though, okay, and this is really the next step in terms of your critical thinking. We're doing it here in the context of a story, but you can apply this to nonfiction as well, any of the career paths that you're on, is your ability to distinguish between the tone of a piece of writing 
and the mood that the writing generates in you. By which I mean, when we read a story, we don't have to take the tone and simply say, okay, well, that's how I'll feel too, right? So um, I've gone on this journey with the narrator and he's traumatized by this event and I understand his trauma and you know I, I endorse his trauma. You may or may not feel that way. But the mood is, is your reaction, right? Your reaction to perhaps this part of the story. Um, we might shift it another way and we might think about the execution scene and think about mood there. So in the execution scene, which isn't necessarily all that long drawn, well, let's, let's go to page 379. So he, here's the execution scene. Um, let's see here. So we just, this is, this is a uh, Belcher starts talking, but so the first captain has been executed poorly and Belcher is now starting to talk and Belcher is aware that he's going to be executed very quickly. Um, okay. So what's he doing? On, on, 379, on 379, he's reflecting on what's going to happen to him. It was an extraordinary thing. This is a few paragraphs down. But in those few minutes, Belcher said more than in all the weeks before. It was just as if the sound of the shot had started a flood of talk in him, and he could go on the whole night like that, quite happily, talking about himself. There's a tone question there, right? Uh, his tone has changed. We stood round like fools now that he couldn't see us any longer. Donovan looked at Noble, and Noble shook his head. Then Donovan raised his Webley, and at the moment Belcher, and at that moment Belcher gives his queer laugh again. He may have thought we were talking about him, or perhaps he noticed the same thing I'd noticed and couldn't understand it. Excuse me, chums, he says. I feel I'm talking the hell of a lot and so silly about my being so handy about a house and things like that. But this thing came on me suddenly. You'll forgive me, I'm sure. You don't want to say a prayer? asks Donovan. No, chum, he says. I don't think it would help. I'm ready and you boys want to get it over. You understand that we're only doing our duty, says Donovan. Belcher's head was raised like a blind man's so that you could only see his chin and the tip of his nose in the lantern light. I never could make out what duty was myself, he said. I think you're all good lads, if that's what you mean. I'm not complaining. And then we go on and we have the execution. And so when we, when we read this passage, um, you know, do we have a, 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 a complex emotional response to it? Do we just listen to Belcher say all of this kind of pleasant stuff? I'm good at cleaning a house. I think everybody's fine. And just kind of read that as just superficially endorsing what's happening. Yep. Just matter of fact. Yep. 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 That would seem to be a pretty superficial reading in the passage, because if we understand what's going on here, this is a man who's about to be shot, right? And he's about to die. And what would be, you know, a reasonable response, what would be an expected response? Do we want his executioners to stop? Do we want them to spare him? Um, is his tone, the tone that he's expressing about being essentially, you know, quite all right with what's about to happen, kind of stiff upper lip, typical British, you know, stereotypical character here, is that is that a reasonable reaction? Uh, or should we want him to have some other kind of reaction? When we get to the end of the story and we think about how Bonaparte's reacting, what we realize is that what's happening here is far more significant than people just doing what they're told to do, right? There are consequences for what's about to happen. Certainly there are consequences for Belcher, which is that he will die. But there's also consequences for the people involved who don't seem to be that aware of the emotional turmoil they're about to enter into Noble, for example, um, by being part of the execution. So when we read the story, we have to ask ourselves, you know, the story has a tone. The narrator is expressing something to us about his subjects um, and how he or she or it feels about it. But we might also ask whether or not that matches up with our own emotional response to the story. And this gets really interesting because this is where we can begin to come up with arguments about the story. So, you know, is the tone something I agree with? Or is the tone something I disagree with? Or, you know, is my mood, what's causing my mood? Where is it coming from? How is the story making me feel a certain way? Why is the story making me feel a certain way? These are all questions we can begin to ask 
and that we can begin to investigate with greater and greater specificity. Now, in this video, I've been talking about kind of the key moments in the, in the, in the short story, right? We're thinking about the opening of the short story, the execution scene, and then the kind of very short conclusion where we have Bonaparte kind of reflecting in the doorway about what has happened and what life will be for like for him now. Um, but we can also do that with a number of smaller moments in the story. We might think about these casual conversations, for example, between Jeremiah Donovan and Bonaparte at a couple of points in the story, how we feel about them, um, what kind of tone is being set when all of the Irish soldiers meet outside and decide that they're going to execute the two men because they've had four of their own, uh, you know, uh, uh, comrades murdered by the British earlier in the day. We might ask, well, what's the tone there? Um, what's my mood as a result? Do these things relate to each other? So it's a whole brand new way of thinking about stories and talking about stories in terms of the class. It's not the only way, and it's not necessarily the most productive way, but it, it's a path forward for you to reflect on what it is you're reading and come up with arguments or observations about what you're reading. And again, it's not just something you have to do with um, uh, with fiction, right? Any kind of document that you receive from a memo to a report to a textbook, you think about the, the tone versus the mood, right? Uh, and how it is these things are related or how it is these things are not related to each other. If we think a little bit more maybe about some of the stories that we've read, um, if we think, for example, about Shiloh, Let's go to Shiloh, page 230. What I actually want to do is go to the end of Shiloh, which is right around 243. This is a third-person narrator, so that's, that's significant. But let's just go to that very last paragraph in Shiloh. Leroy gets up to follow his wife, but his good leg is asleep and his bag leg still hurts. Norma Jean is far away, walking rapidly toward the bluff by the river, and he tries to hobble toward her. Some children run past him, screaming noisily. Norma Jean has reached the bluff, and she is looking out over the Tennessee River. I'm going to read some more in a second, but as I'm reading this, think about Hemingway in Hills Like White Elephants, and how in Hills Like White Elephants, all you had were these matter-of-fact statements. Was essentially what you have here, all these matter-of-fact statements. Leroy gets up to follow his wife, but his good leg is asleep and his bad leg still hurts. Norma Jean is far away, walking rapidly toward the bluff by the river, and he tries to hobble towards her. There's not a lot here that is very explicit about you know, how it is this narrator is relating to either character, except that... The narrator, the tone here with both of these characters is very matter of fact. Now she turns, to turns toward Leroy and waves her arms. Is she beckoning him? It's a question. The narrator is raising an explicit question about his subject, in this case, Norma. So one of the things the narrator is saying is, I don't know. So when we think about the tone of the third person narrated in Norma, right, the, the narrator is not giving us a specific answer. It's raising a question. So it's an attitude of questioning. The narrator is questioning. She seems to be doing an exercise. Notice seems not specific. The narrator is saying, I don't know what she's doing. She seems to be doing an exercise for her chest muscles. The sky is unusually pale. The color of the dust ruffle Mabel made for their bed. And in that last sentence, right, the voice shifts out of describing the scene in a matter-of-fact way and brings up an image that literally has their marriage read, identified in it, right? So the tone literally shifts at the very end by reminding the reader of their marriage after raising this question about whatever it may be that Norma Jean is doing. So when we think about the tone at the end of Shiloh, what we might notice is that the tone goes through these interesting changes in the last paragraph, where the narrator is relating to his subjects in a very matter-of-fact way, but then raises a question and then immediately reminds us of their marriage. 
Okay, so that's what the narrator does. The question is then, well, what's my mood when I read this story? When I get to the end of the story and I read this passage, now different people may have different emotional reactions, but if I'm going to explain what my mood is, I have to base that on what's actually in front of me. So I have to say, well, I am uncertain. I'm uncertain because the narrator does these interesting things by presenting me with all this matter-of-fact information, but then with, by raising a question that the matter-of-fact information can't answer. And then I'm hit with the image of the marriage bed. And so I am left uncertain. My mood changes from being certain about what's going to happen to being uncertain. And so in that instance, I would say that the narrator, the tone is quite effective in how it transforms my mood, right? And I could explain that. Now, you don't have to agree with me. You may have a very different mood here, but that's what we need to think about. How does the tone, how do, excuse me, the tone and the mood relate or diverge from each other? In a little while, we'll get to a story by Edgar Allan Poe, and I think there'll be a lot of opportunities there to think about tone and mood and how they relate. But anyway, guests of the nation, um, very sad story. Uh, but a story that can show us a lot about the benefit of approaching literature with a context. I know what literature does, essentially. I know what, it's, I know what it can do. If I stick with the story, I can find out something significant about a person, which I think is what you get in Guests of the Nation. Again, you may disagree, but I think there's a pretty strong case for that to be made. So I hope you enjoy reading it.